Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, um, and thank you to the ASWF uh, for the opportunity to present today on leveraging academia. These are some ideas to stimulate new approaches, build a stronger entry-level pool, and impact DEI. My name is Karen Ruggles. I'm an associate professor of computer science with a specialty in digital art and 3D animation. I teach at DeSales University, which is about an hour north of uh, Philadelphia, about an hour, hour and a half, depending on how you're driving, west of New York City. I've been teaching full time for 10 years, and I'm also a proud member of the ASWS Diversity and Inclusion Working Group since 2021. If you at all received an email trying to recruit you to be a mentor for the summer learning program, chances are that came from me or had some of my fingerprints on it. But today I'm gonna to focus not to recruit you to be a mentor, although you should totally do that, um, but also to uh, talk a, a little bit about how we can build some bridges uh, between academia and entry-level talent. Let's start by framing the challenge and how that is complicated by our current academic landscape. The part of the challenge that this group might know all too well is the current state of technical talent and the difficulties of finding and keeping new talent. If you haven't looked at the State of Tech uh, from Linux Foundation's 2023 um, State of Tech Talent Report, I would definitely recommend that you take a look. It has a lot, of, lot more nuances than we're gonna be able to cover here today, um, but I'm gonna uh, take a look at some of the um, information as it pertains to this challenge. <clears throat> we are seeing um, that uh, talent is shifting in tech right now. From respondents to the report, more than 50% of organizations revise their hiring plans by freezing new hires. We also see that roles are being cut, with senior technical roles having the largest percentage of cutbacks. When seeking new hires, the, the time investment doesn't always pay off. The average time to fill a technical position is 4.3 months. The average onboarding process across all organizations is uh, 2.6 months. And turnover, whether that be voluntary or involuntary, of new hires is 29%. So almost one in three new hires depart uh, within six months of being onboarded. It's no surprise then that 70% of organizations emphasize training opportunities for existing technical staff or upskilling. This emphasizes mid-career folks um, with only a trickle of new hires, including entry level. Let's now examine some areas in academia. It's worth noting that these figures are for the United States, uh, which is where I teach, so uh, that's what my focus is going to be on today. First, let's touch on demographics. We've been experiencing less people pursuing undergraduate degrees, and there are a lot of contributing factors to this. The pandemic caused about a 10% reduction of undergraduate students, which has not rebounded. That's 1.4 million people that are just gone. This is complicated further by the demographic cliff. Uh, this is a 15% decrease in the population density for traditional college going ages starting in 2026. As a faculty member, I've seen firsthand and heard a lot of stories about students being less prepared for an undergraduate education whether that be academically, emotionally, or financially. 22% of high school graduates say they weren't ready for college due to lack of uh, emotional and academic preparedness. This is up from 19% in 2019. Not only are, they less, are there less students in general, with more of them feeling underprepared for the rigors of undergraduate education, but there's also a hesitance to pursue a higher education due to, the, due to cost and debt. The average cost of tuition and fees for a private four-year institution has risen 124.3% since 2004. That's about 6.2% per year. The burden of debt um, after graduation is also a huge concern for students looking to pursue this uh, as a return on investment. 
uh, in 2020, um, students, the typical student um, borrowed about $30,000, which is about two times more than the same student in 2007. The challenge we see is that it's hard to hire and retain new talent, which is taking the emphasis away from newbies in favor of upskilling. Hiring new gradu graduates is only going to get more complicated in three to four years time with less people making it through to graduation. So what can we do about it? Us, here, in this room. I have a few ideas um, to close out our time today, but I'm also looking for creative solutions. So if you want to link with me on LinkedIn or have a conversation here or um, for our, our online folks, um, you can definitely engage me on Slack. I'd be more than happy to uh, continue this conversation after the presentation. Here, we will focus on ways to engage with academia, which I will frame in three tiers. Each tier will have different actions we all can do when leaving here today. We will start our tiers with inspiration. To keep our focus on academia, we will distill the inspiration efforts with middle schoolers all the way up to undergraduate, maybe first year students. The goal here is shining a light on the landscape of visual effects and 3D animation. Many high schoolers choose their major because of a very limited scope. They know someone in their life who has that job and so that's what they're gonna do. Their grades were high in a specific subject or they think they can make a lot of money with that major. Not many high schoolers know a pipeline developer in visual effects. If they did, they might be inspired to follow those footsteps and choose to pursue computer science as their major. Not many high schools have a computer science class, so they can't get the grades to be like, wow, this is, this is me. That is changing, but that is um, something that we need to consider. High schoolers who, um, we, what we end up with at this point is high schoolers who have no idea that their passion for film and technology is a career and that the roadmap to get there is through computer science. Which leads us to our first point in our tier, which is to give young people a label for their interests. Giving them a label allows them to work towards something. The second point, which is critical for the diversity component here, is empowerment. This could be as simple as telling somebody, I believe you can do this. Or making sure representation of diverse people completing these tech roles is highlighted. The representation is crucial, whether that's gender, ethnicity, race, disability status, or even where someone is from. Where I teach, which I mentioned is kind of close to those metro hubs, New York City, Philadelphia, I also have a lot of students from rural locations. And that can make some barriers for these students to see themselves contributing to blockbuster movies. No one they know has done that, which makes a leap, that leap towards that is my goal, that much more complicated. <clears throat> The ability to see oneself in one's own desired future can melt barriers. <laughs> Representation matters. So what are some actions we can do to help these little young ones? How can we label and empower? What does that look like? Even as an individual, you can tell your story. Every person here has some aspect of their life that will inspire a young programmer. That could be some adverse effect that you overcame, right? Your background, your story, where you're from. Everyone here has that inside of them. Encourage your colleagues to share those same ideas. Inspire those young people. Or suggest that your organization highlight these stories for young people to see. There are also opportunities to plug into existing efforts. For example, a few years ago, the ASWF Diversity and Inclusion Working Group did a webinar series that addressed this aspect. We organized bi-weekly information sessions in careers in film and technology, followed by Q&A sessions. This was available globally. 
Rise Up Animation posts content on YouTube with similar ideas of information for affinity groups of underserved populations. And I'm sure each organization here can create various promotional material meant to go behind the scenes to define careers in tech. Starting early will help young people focus on a goal before they leave high school. Any group, when they feel inspired and empowered, is motivated to learn. They have the goal, now they need the skill set. So tier two is education. I may have a bit of knowledge here, um, but again, we can offload a lot of this step-by-steps to colleges, universities, to teach them the basics, you know, required programming language, DCCs, et cetera. Um, this step is already well established so, uh, and, and relied upon for um, many expectations for new hires, but we'll get to some new ways to approach that in the action steps. Education does not need to be formal though. I know this is strange to hear from me as an associate professor, but everyone's path is different. <laughs> Informal education, such as boot camps, self-taught resources, and self-paced learning platforms um, can provide accessible skill sets to people who hit the tier one, the inspiration piece, a little bit later in life. Informal education can be tough to assess, especially when reviewing a new hire this is why we do this in job listings. We require must-have bachelor's degree in, in computer science. It's a little bit easier to thin down the pool when that is on the listing. It is helpful, um, but ask yourself what really needs to be done in order for this person to be successful in the job. Could we keep that CS degree requirement, but also add or, or a certification, or demonstrated ability? Next up is a different kind of education, mentorship. Whoops, <laughs> a little too fast. There we go. Uh, the, the, the steps that students have taken thus far have consistently narrowed their focus only to find out how wide that action is. They go from all the majors that they could possibly choose from to computer science. And then from computer science, they're, wow, this is really big. So I'll focus on VFX and 3D animation and then they see how big that is. So this idea that it's going from big to small, this micro macro uh, scoping can be extremely disorienting for, for young people. Having a mentor to help the student be nimble through that scope variance helps them streamline their efforts towards goal setting. So what about this tier? What can we all do here leaving today to help this? Orgs could use their public-facing resources like social media um, or their websites to create roadmaps. These can be for new learners or uh, for the, you know, a uh, undergraduate student. Creating roadmaps for young learners can be in conjunction with academic partners, I'm always happy to help, or within your organization. It could be as, as simple as listing uh, bullet-pointed um, skills for common entry-level positions. This could be posted on an early careers type of page. This information is usually accessible on job listings, but many students do not look at job listings until they are actively looking for a job. This is also going to create evergreen content for interested students who are poking around on your website to um, help them choose their classes or for them to upskill on their own. Talk to your alma mater about skills your organization needs. This help, helps those doing the education stay fresh and relevant as they hone their curriculum. Talk within your organization to see what connections to academia you collectively have and where impact can be streamlined. See if your organization is able to create learning content. I've recently seen that Electronic Arts has created a free, self-paced, six-hour career-ready program on software engineering. They link this career-ready content to appropriate entry-level positions, indicating that applicants who complete that content will stand out in the application process. The ASWF um, Summer Learning Program has assembled a list of free and low-cost resources for applicants who don't make it into the summer cohort, and I'm hoping to, that that will grow in the next couple of years. Um, so if you have any type of content that relates to that, please shoot it over to me so I can include it in our uh, 
our resource list that's already um, under development. Become a mentor yourself. Your, your perspective is incredibly valuable. No matter where you are in the industry or how long you've been in that role, you are the dream for many of these young people. I know I mentioned before that I wasn't going to recruit you to be an ASWF Summer Learning Program mentor, but I may have lied about that a little bit. Um, so here are some of the dates just to think about uh, becoming a mentor. SLP is a wonderful way to just plug into mentorship. We provide you the mentee, um, and the obligation here runs through the summer. It is about eight weeks, um, so June 16th to August 9th. And uh, you meet with a learner for about 30, 60 minutes a week um, for maybe six or seven times. So there is time to go on vacation and unplug and not have to be a part of that. I can always be your touch point there if that sounds interesting to you. We made it. Tier three of three. Our tier one middle schoolers have grown up. They have gotten inspired, went to college, and learned from you as an SLP mentor. So what are we here um, what is tier three? Agency. This can be a really scary time for some young people. Agency is when they decide to leave the safety of education and apply their learning to solve real world problems. Agency is where they leap the gap that I mentioned previously. They transition from tier two of education to tier three of um, agency with another infusion of em empowerment and confidence. The, this translates to applicable and marketable skills to be hired. We can't leap for them, but we can create sandboxes for them to demo their strength and gain that confidence to leap. Internships are the obvious agency action here. My goal in listing it here, however, is to encourage the analysis of existing internship on-ramps and if, and if needed, advocate to diversify that process. Try not to only go to one school for interns. See if internships can be paid. Explore abilities to create remote and hybrid opportunities. Outside of the ASWF, I have heard recruiters say things like, if a student doesn't have an internship, I'm automatically throwing the application away. This can be really easy, again, to thin down that applicant pool because you can just say, no internship, no internship. But that definitely thins the pool for a, a very specific uh, group of people. Consider alternatives, such as contributing to an open source project, um, uh, mentorship experiences like the ASWF's summer learning program, or participating in Google Summer of Code or Google Summer Season of Docs. If this alternative is valued in, in the adoption, make sure to let that be known and repost application announcements um, on your recruitment socials. Publicly valuing alternatives to internships is helpful for students who need to work summer jobs to pay for all of that, <laughs> that price that they're going to school for. Um, remote internships are competitive, and many internships within driving distance for many students' hometown may not be a one-to-one -one match for applicable experience. If alternatives to internships are publicly valued, then the, the student can spend their days working that job and their nights contributing to open source projects. Uh, this keeps more students engaged in this industry rather than letting them go off to be at a local tech company because they interned there and it was safe. Consider engaging masters or PhD students into elevated opportunities for deeper and more specific tasks. And finally, um, consider hosting your own code jams or similar type of competition as a recruitment event. If that seems like a lot to assemble, connect with some schools or affinity groups to have them organize, and you can just be the judge. These are a lot of different ways that we can um, really access th this younger, vibrant community that wants to be in this industry, but they simply don't know how. Our responsibility here is to create that on-ramp so that we can um, diversify this industry. 
I've included um, some resources uh, that I'm, I'm happy to share this presentation with anybody, um, but you know, so you could get the, the link functionality and everything. But I did post it here, uh, so if you want to take a quick uh, screenshot or um, or anything, uh, it'll be easy. I should it, there should be enough information to uh, to find what I was pushing forward here. Um, I do look forward to continuing the, the conversation, so please add me on LinkedIn, find me on Slack, find me here um, if, you, if you happen to be in person, and I do want to thank you all for your time and attention. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, thanks. Uh, one of the things that you have up there is the <laughs> idea of becoming a mentor. Yes. Uh, there's a lot to becoming a mentor. Are there any materials that go along with it? Because you can't just suddenly become a mentor. You need, like, there's, is there support? Yeah, for sure. So I, I'll speak to the um, summer learning program that's hosted through the ASWF Diversity Inclusion Working Group. Uh, so we do have a sort of starter pack um, for new mentors or existing mentors to help facilitate some of those conversations um, that you engage with uh, for the, the eight-week um, uh, summer learning program. So yes, they do exist. They're also open. Um, so if, it, if you don't engage with the SLP, you can still look at that material. Um, and it's, it's within the, um, uh, the, um, <laughs> uh, the diversity and inclusion working group, um, summer learning program webpage on the ASWF.io. I was trying to remember where exactly it was. Yeah. Does that address your question? Yeah, I think that's enough. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, Nick. So sometimes there's funding available, like mm -hmm. uh, British Columbia, for example, has uh, money available to UBC to help them collaborate with industry. Mm -hmm. um, and what I hear from professors at UBC is it's, they don't know who to talk to, and they're having trouble like literally spending money that they have on the table because mm -hmm. they don't have anybody to talk to in our community. And I wonder how much of that sort of... Uh, funding is out there and if we have any kind of ways to like connect these streams and maybe take advantage of uh, people who are, are willing to are get involved yeah. but they don't know how to talk to us. Yeah, I see um, that happening quite frequently, this, um, this passion to want to be involved um, but then not knowing the resource to, to plug into. Um, in the past, especially with the Diversity and Inclusion Working Group, uh, we found a lot of uh, positivity through these types of conversations. So really word of mouth and trying to say, oh, who do you know there? Can I talk to them? And trying to uh, treat that like a funnel to try to get a, a point person who can speak to on behalf of and create connections that can elevate um, all, of, all of what we value um, in this. So if you do know anybody, I'd be happy to chat with them um, to amplify some of the, the on-ramps there. And I will recruit further. If mentorship is not your thing, the summer learning program also has need of panelists for panels that we hold for the learners as well as individual speakers and other volunteer opportunities. So if you're interested, please reach out, uh, slp at uh, aswift.io. Thank you. And can you share some of like the success stories from previous SLPs? Like, have we seen them go into the industry? Like, yeah, for sure. Uh, so this is our fourth cohort um, coming up this this summer, and we've had some remarkable success. So um, I worked with with Carol and with Rachel and with Emily to uh, to really bring this to fruition. And since our um, our first cohort, we've seen a high percentage of uh, SLPs convert into working somewhere in the industry. Some are pursuing um, doctorate degrees or advanced education uh, to add a specific, you know, um, like rendering um, idea, which is really, really exciting. These are really engaged um, people who want to learn more. I will say to, to your point, Emily, that we do see a lot of uh, juniors, seniors, maybe new grads come into the, the SLP. We do also host a um, end of program, you know, kind of 
soiree, uh, which is all online, obviously, and we uh, celebrate the work that they've done. Um, so it's a, a great time for recruiters at your organization to come to a 45-minute presentation of 20 um, learners who've spent the summer connecting with the industry. Um, most of the SLPs are pursuing computer science, and they may be in their junior, senior year, and then they discover uh, the, the, this industry, which is when they say, well, I can't really add on a minor, right, because college is too expensive for me to continue on. I need to finish here. Uh, and they might not have even seen Maya before, but that's usually where we, we capture them. They have the programming knowledge, but they're learning a little bit more about the, the creative, the DCCs effectively. So that's where our mentorship and some of the, the teams um, get together and say, great, you know this piece, now what do you want to do? Let's talk about that. Let's uh, think about that landscape, which was that inspiration component that I talked about in tier one. So we try to cover a lot of tiers uh, during the, the summer learning program, um, and the success has, has been uh, quite pronounced. Thank you. Sorry, I have one last question. Yes, please. Um, is there anything at the academy level, um, like one level above us, that uh, might be synergistic, as it were? That's a great question that I'm not sure I know the answer to. Um, one, one of the things that we, we have uh, tried to elevate is, um, you know, we, these are on-ramps for um, underserved populations primarily is the focus for the summer learning program. Um, and so that's wonderful, but we also want to capture the students at this time. I call them students because I'm, <laughs> I'm a professor, but they don't necessarily have to be undergraduate students. Um, at, but, but we do want to capture them at this level and make them very interested in what we do here at the ASWF, so converting them over to be um, you know, open source contributors. So we've made a, 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 um, a pointed effort within the last set, uh, cohort, cohort and a half really, to say, hey, this is, these are some of the projects, here's the landscape of ASWF. And um, we had a few contributors who were a little bit more on the um, agency side uh, start to convert over and, and participate in Dev Days this past October. So that's another synergy, synergy, synergy way that we can amplify them at their early stages, getting them interested and invested in open source, uh, which is you know where they can kind of amplify and keep going up. And Emily, it looked like you wanted to chat on something. Um, we have had talks with the Academy here or there. I think they have the gold stars program, but it's definitely more, less technical because they cover the gamut mm. of roles. But I definitely think there's more work we could do there to see how do we leverage that arm to get more talent in on the technical side. Thanks, Emily. Uh, Karen, I want to make sure that I get a chance to talk with you. I'm with the Linux Foundation. I work with Emily and John and support mm -hmm. Academy of Software along with several other, uh, other projects. One thing I did want to point out, perhaps the room's not a, aware of it, but the Linux Foundation um, obviously is involved in training and certifications across all industries. But one of the things we do in, that helps support what you're talking about is free classes through the edX program. If you've ever heard of it, little e, little d, capital X, we're one of thousands of vendors that use them and their platform. And we've been with them about 10 years back when you didn't even know what the Linux Foundation was and you couldn't find us. That's why we use them. We still continue to support them and have over 60 classes. Um, and it's and some of those are around basic fundamentals transitioning, like introduction to Linux, if you're coming from a Unix, Solaris background, or Microsoft, and you're moving into the dominant operating system, or a new technology. A, a DevOps SRE wasn't even a job four or five years ago, yep. and that's one of the hottest jobs around. So we're big believers of the tech, um, tech report, because we obviously create it through <laughs> our research. But that gives the training and certification organization the roadmap for where they should point to have classes and availability where it's a new technology like blockchain, FinOps, mm -hmm. DevOps, SRE job, um, and then uh, trends where people are moving to things. And so I definitely encourage, and I've talked to John about this and David as well, any of the projects that ultimately could have a class that could mm -hmm. be out on edX, leverage that like FinOps and uh, Hyperledger and all of them are doing because the introduction to blockchain Introduction to FDC3, which is the desktop. We all know Mr. <laughs> Mr. Bloomberg, big billionaire. The open source project is pretty much replacing a lot of that. 
is a free class out there. So the other projects use that platform to promote their technologies and their open source projects to get more exposure to young, old, new, and everything else. And in the college area, you're doing a 30,000 foot flyover a lot of times on Java, C++, Linux. That introduction to Linux class is a 60 hour class with labs. Over a million people have taken that class. And college students tell me personally that they, they couldn't code to save their life until they took that class. So mm -hmm. any supplements like that can be valuable as well. So we really encourage you to have uh, any exposure to your technologies in, in a class format like that, because we'd love to have it on the, in the catalog. Yeah, I definitely see where there could be a lot of synergies there, whether that it's in the undergraduate programs. So example, um, going to your organizations, if you do find, okay, who do we have as a contact at my alma mater um, on our team? And then connecting with them to say, hey, did you realize that this resource was available to you? Uh, if you if you do this, then maybe we can set up a uh, a Zoom session where we do a Q and A session with your your students who've completed right sort of a, a gamifying that idea of how do we get students motivated if it's not a course because they are they are slammed a lot of my students they they have a full course load and they work jobs just to stay afloat and and be you know um, in the classroom so to ask them to then upskill outside of of the classroom can be a real challenge you know they're also involved in extracurricular ex activities as well so the summer is a really wonderful time to try to invigorate that and i think to your point to emphasize that to undergraduate to say hey if you do this certification that's going to stand out more than an internship that you did at your local mom and pop. They, they definitely get really wonderful experiences by um, going to an internship, but if it's the, the tech side that they can still work on, especially as a sophomore where they don't usually get an internship until their junior year. And as I was mentioning before, the um, many of my students, and I could imagine many, many students who don't live in metro areas, uh, they don't get those you know, online remote internships. And especially if they need it to be paid in order to make it viable for them, it makes the summer, okay, I guess I'm going back to the pool and lifeguarding because I need to get paid, right? And that's not an applicable, I mean, I'm sure there are things that you can, <laughs> you can twist there, but if we say instead like, hey, this would be a wonderful time for you to do that, sure, go get paid, but also think about this certification process. And they don't know what they don't know if they, if they don't have the undergraduate or the, um, the roadmap, like I was talking about, to help them find that path. Um, so many of them don't see it yet, and that's what the, the inspiration aspect is about. But yeah, I would love to have a further conversation. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Thank you.